Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, children of all ages, welcome to another action-packed episode of the Jim Stroud Show. Uh, I was at SourceCon having a great time. Uh, I was training um, some people on uh, some sourcing techniques, and then I had the fortunate opportunity to sit down and listen to uh, my guest, who you'll be hearing from in just a moment. And the topic I thought was intriguing, so I sat down, had a little notepad, I was ready to take notes and just sort of soak it all in. And then as he proceeded to speak, uh, he uh, started to scare me <laughs> as well as <laughs> the other people in the audience. Our boots were shaking, our knees were knocking, and I said, okay, this guy from now on, his name is Mr. Scary. Uh, Mr. Scary, <laughs> Mr. Scary, if you would, introduce yourself what you do, and why what you said was so scary. Hi, Jim. Uh, as you said, Derek Zoller. I work for uh, Advanced Resource Technologies Incorporated in uh, just outside of D.C. We're in the Nova area. Um, I'm the recruiting manager, I guess is the best way to put it. I'm a one-man band here at our, our little shop. Uh, we are okay. being a government contractor. Um, I was bringing up the new OFCCP regulations that will be kicking off March 24th, and kind of what you need to know uh, about the new regulations and how it's going to affect sourcing and recruiting. Yeah, very, very eye-opening. Um, if you would, for those people who are listening um, who deal with the government or maybe they're, they're contracting the government in some way, I want you to talk a little bit to that, and then for the, the part that was scaring me, talk about how all the OCCP stuff is relevant to people who do not work with the government as well, if you wouldn't mind. Oh, absolutely. Uh, the the main changes have been, and they're really not changes, it's stuff that a lot of people should have been doing. And I just think they didn't know. Um, it's the, well, the new rule 503C that came out uh, primarily was about two major things, one of which was uh, recruiting for people with disabilities and hiring veterans and hiring people with benchmarks and goals. The OSCCP also came out with its own form, <clears throat> and the form basically is a new form that, just like we have for the EEOC, it's a new form that the OSCCP put out that uh, shows a compliance section to show that if a person does have a disability, what kind of disability do they have? Um, and it's a form that needs to be used pre-employment and actually post-employment. So they're asking actually the HR departments now to have everyone fill out one of these forms uh, starting March 24th and then reporting it every year. The uh, the thing to know, though, is that this is not a quota. It's more what they're more interested in is uh, outreach, uh, that more companies are reaching out to people with disabilities, to people that are, are you know, currently veterans that are getting out or have been or are veterans now, um, and making sure that you're reaching out to these people and coming out to them. The uh, the piece that, that I think that probably freaked everybody out a little bit more was the reporting and recording piece. And I think a lot of people kind of went and kind of didn't notice that or kind of went flying by it. Uh, it's the data collection. Um, Every applicant has to fill out this disclosure form, though. But on top of it, if they don't identify themselves, if they don't call, you know, email you or apply to your position and you're doing more of sourcing, like external sourcing, uh, then you need to use a data management technique that shows how you got to the resumes. Um, in other words, your search strings. You should probably do even like a... a uh, uh, a, a screenshot, excuse me, sorry, I just couldn't remember that. Uh, okay. A screenshot of whatever database you're using, so if it's using Career Builder, Monster, Dice, you know, Indeed, Craigslist, whatever. Um, they want to know that you're not putting in search strings that would otherwise discriminate against veterans, disabled, or even under EEOC. Wow. That, yeah, that. <laughs> so this also, not to, not to let that sink in for a minute, but this also includes um, any third-party vendors that you're using. So in other words, if you rely heavily on a tech systems or a K-Force or even some of the smaller boutique firms, they mm -hmm. themselves are not required to do any of this, but you are required to make sure that they did it. 
So in other wow. words, yeah, in other words, it's going to be a new legal lease for your contract, but you have to more than likely we're going to have to put something in there that states with these these you know these staffing firms that they're being compliant as well and that they're doing the same types of things, even if they're using their own internal database. Let me try to wrap my my mind around it for someone who's <laughs> right. listening. All right, so say there's a there's a rec for uh, just say an engineer. I don't care what kind of engineer it is. And um, I am doing my searches. I'm doing my in-title resume and keywords and all that kind of stuff. And as I normally would. But to ensure that I'm not in trouble with Uncle Sam later, I should go ahead and toss in terms like uh, handy capable or or um, uh, worse like handicapped or, or, or things like that just so that um, I can show Uncle Sam, look, when I did my search string, I added the word handicap to my search string. If that's the right word yeah. to use. I don't want to... that, that could be a way around it. The other thing to do is to actually use, um, you know, uh, use different databases that comply, like CareerBuilder, for example, has a, you know, a system that they, they actually post your job for in, uh, in niche sites. Um, so if you can, it's almost a good idea to go to the niche sites and do some searches there as well, just to show that you're you're trying. Um, you know, if you, even job fairs, there's actual specific jobs for for disabled people. There's job fairs for veterans. Um, it, it's gonna, it's definitely gonna change the way we do our sourcing, though. That's for sure. Well, you think this sets um, sort of signals a boom for certain job boards, more niche job boards, uh, who are focused Absolutely. on um, minority candidates or something? Absolutely. Um, we've I've been bombarded by email and phone. <laughs> I've never really? of people I've never heard of before. I'm like, they're like, yeah, we've been around for you know six years or seven years or fifteen years. I'm like, really? So awesome. You know, I'd love to see your database uh, and work with them uh, you know, because the other part of this is going to be the reporting tool. Um, you need to show on an actual like spreadsheet of all the different places that you've gone in order to see if you can find somebody that is, you know, fits one of these categories um, and show if they worked or not. So you have to literally say, well, you know, I went to this particular job board or I went to this particular job fair, so on and so forth, and I received this many resumes. And out of those resumes, a couple were good, but we couldn't use them, so on and so forth. It's going to do a lot of things that we don't like doing as recruiters. <laughs> Let me let me play devil's advocate here. Let's say let's say that I'm the owner of um, of Monster or something, right? So I got this huge job board of all these people in it, and I want to uh, ensure I want my customers to feel uh, that they don't have to go to a uh, a niche job board because we have so many people in here. I'm sure a certain population is is African American or Hispanic or disabled or whatever the case may be. So I, as Monster, I'm going to say, you know what, I'm going to pull all the people that are in my database and say, hey, we're trying to be inclusive. Uh, we want to make sure that we are representing all people in our, in our database. Would you mind putting, you know, checking a survey box that says I am of African descent or Spanish descent or what have you? And then my intention for that would be, okay, to cover my bases, help retain some customers. But potential backlash of that might be some people, and there's always somebody, is going to say, okay, I did your survey, I checked my ethnicity, and now I'm not getting any job offers. So now I'm mad at you, monster, because I think you're discriminating against me. I can yeah. see that happening. <laughs> I can 100% <laughs> see that happening. That's the, <laughs> the biggest issue I had with the form. And if you go to the, if you go to the OFCC, OFCCP website, the form is up. It's a PDF file that's up there. Um, not to, yeah, the address I, I, send to me, and I'll, I'll I'll add a link to that for people listening. Send me the link. I'll add a link to that in the description um, of, of this okay. uh, podcast, so people can check it out. Listen, yeah, well, send it to me after the show, and then I'll, I'll go ahead and and add that to the description there. But I see how that's if someone's yeah, doing business with government, how that can just really uh, add extra hoops to jump over to get your get your work done. That's going to be the issue, too, and the, the problem with the form, in my opinion, not that anybody yeah. really cares if it is, but, <laughs> OFCCP, but um, it doesn't give you – our form that we have for EEOC says, I choose not to self-identify. Right. We don't allow you to do that on this form. 
this one is yes I'm disabled or no I'm not disabled. And if it's yes I am disabled, then you go to another form that you tell them what the disability is. Now people will immediately think of a disability as someone that's you know handicapped in a wheelchair, for example, or might be legally blind or deaf. The the app the, the definition of what a disabled candidate can be can be any there's, a, there's just a massive amount of things that you can consider to be disabled. Um, depression is considered disability. Um, I don't know many people that are going to want to put down on a form that they're applying for a job and say, yeah, I I I battled with depression. You know, because the, you know, the employer, most people are going to think the employer is not going to want to hire me now. So either they're not right. going to self-identify, which doesn't solve any problems, or they are going to identify and, like you said, be fearful that nobody's going to pick up the phone and call them back. Now let me ask you this. Since the burden is on the company to make sure this information is there, would the recruiter say, okay, you know what, I'm going to look at this person, and they look like they're Asian to me, or they look like they're African American to me. I'm going to go ahead and check that box. But that other person might not identify uh, themselves the way a recruiter might identify themselves. So mm -hmm. I, could that lead to some issues as well? Yep. I yep. agree. Uh, I just, it just seems to me that it's a, a really large, just uh, like a large landmine. <laughs> That you know, you just, you just the easiest way to get around it is just not to just not identify to say no, I don't have any disabilities. Uh, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna go just one more step, just one more step towards the crazy train. Okay. Facebook recently, uh, I think it was a couple weeks back, they initiated a new way to self-classify yourself. No longer could you choose between male and female, but you have male, female, uh, uh, tra transgendered, uh, and I think. 10 or 10 other classifications of how you can uh, identify your gender. I wonder if the government will see that and eventually try to integrate that into this kind of form. Uh, just to throw it out there. From what you've seen, do you, do you think that could possibly happen? I mean, I, I, I don't see it happening. At this point, it wouldn't soon, surprise but... me. At this point, it wouldn't <laughs> surprise me. It really wouldn't. Um, yeah, I, <laughs> I don't know. I seriously don't know how to answer that. I I would wouldn't be surprised if it happened, but I would. I mean, it's just. I think we've already kind of gone off the cliff as it is at this point. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, so. and, and, and I'm I'm really just speculating. I'm really just speculating. I I want to get a little bit to the part that was scaring me a bit because uh, not only when I was listening to this, I said I was thinking to myself, okay, I don't have any government contracts. I'm not working with Uncle Sam and placing people or working with the Lockheed Martins right now or anything like that. So I'm, 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 it was interesting, a little scary, and I was feeling sorry for other people. But then you brought this point about how there's been talk and potential legislation about making these kind of rules available to all businesses, uh, whether they're doing work with Uncle Sam or not. Am I, am I remembering that correctly? It's just my opinion. Um, Oh, okay. I look okay. back. I look back when we first when we first started in 2006, and I remember going to a recruiting conference for internal conference for us when I was with SAIC, and people were freaking out about you know just what we had gone through way before even this, and they were doing the you know, definition of an applicant and things like that, an internet applicant, and it wasn't exactly what was they thought it was and things like that. But you know we we had the title we've had this happened before with the EEOC and I, I see this as just being yet another layer that's coming on and they, they did the EEOC primarily for the government started out and then they made it a national a federal thing um, I could see this becoming a federal thing if it becomes a positive for the OFCCP um, one of the things I think see it is, is it's definitely a, a, a way to generate money because if you you aren't they leave things open to be relatively gray so you don't, they didn't tell you what, how many things that you should show. I mean, they kept things very kind of open and very fluid. So if you do get audited, you're not really sure, you know, well, you know, I'm sorry you didn't make the cut, so that's gonna, you're going to you know, get a $50,000 fine. Um, I know some, when I was at the conference, I know some people that I, I had talked to, I won't name names, but they told me that they had been audited by OCCP last year nine times. Mm. So that tells me that they're looking. They're, they're they're looking for you to to slip up in my opinion. Um, I have I know some people have gone through audits. They're not fun. 
Um, but there's a way to protect yourself. I mean, make sure that you're, any other audits that you have to do, like a DCAA audit, or if you're putting your filing in your EEOC forms and, and all that stuff, make sure everything is, is, is up to speed. Um, don't give them a reason to want to come around you. Uh, because if they do, and it's, like I said, if it is successful, I could see this kind of spilling over and making everybody basically do it. Wow. Yeah, I know. Yeah, that, that was making <laughs> me. That's the part that was making me nervous. <laughs> yeah, as I was, as we were saying, you were in the audience. It's just everybody's mouth kind of hit the floor. <laughs> and this is sort of, it's, it's kind of like, really, this is crazy. Uh, and the sad part is, is there's so many people that are within our, with my industry, as a government contractors, that they don't know this. You know, they don't know. They don't even know. Some of them don't know that they were government contractors. Hmm. Because we think to tend to think, well, I don't have anybody employed in the federal government, or I'm not employing anybody in the federal government. I don't have contractors working for me. But if you have a contract with the federal government, for example, if you're a, a soda vendor, like a large soda vendor out of Atlanta, mm -hmm. then you are a government contractor because you're under a government contract. So then they consider yourself to be a government contractor. So a lot of times these or what companies will do as well, that's that piece of the business. You know, we have that. That's our government side. So we're going to have them over sitting over here with their own with their own database, and they do their own thing. And they don't they don't see separation with inside of a company. If a company is doing business with the government, the entire company has to be OCCP compliant. And that's the reason why, once again, in my opinion, that that like Booz Allen Hamilton split and uh, SEIC this split with and became Lidos. because the commercial section, the commercial divisions were getting dragged down by these requirements. So they decided to go pair off and do, do straight commercial and then have another group do straight government and be two separate companies. Wow. What if a company is doing business with the government, but say they have less than 50 employees or less than 100 employees? Yeah, there are, there are, there are, some, there are rules, um, and I probably should have put the written this down. Uh, no worries. We'll add them in the uh, we'll add them in the uh, description of the video in the notes section. <laughs> yeah, there are it. there are specific rules for government contractors. If you have if you're less than I think either 50 employees or 25 employees, and you're doing less than five million in contracts, then you're not required to be OCCP compliant. Um, but that's a the numbers are relatively small. If, once again, it's on the OCCP website. If you go to it. That's the main site. There's a lot of stuff there. I mean, everything I talked about, I just kind of highlighted when I did, and I did the uh, when I did my uh, sourcing lab, and then also the blogs post that I've written for it. Um, sure. And you know, there's there's definitely in the D.C. area. There's definitely places you can go to talk to. I mean, there's OCCP compliance companies that help you get compliant or you know make sure that you're compliant. Uh, and it's something I would recommend people do, um, again, and check out the, the actual website, the OCCP website. It'll tell you about the Section 503 self-identification form. It's like, right, I'm looking at it right now. Everything's up there. And it'll tell you, you know, what this is, what you, if you're required, if you're not required. And they do have 800 numbers, and they do respond to emails. It takes them a little time, but <laughs> they will get, they will try it. I mean, they, they're not bad. They're just, they're trying, they want you to succeed, I think, at a certain point. But uh, they're, you know, when this goes through, it's, they're going to be very serious about it. I, before we run out of time, could you name maybe two or three things uh, sourcers need to do just to stay ahead of OCCP so that, so that uh, they do not get on the government radar? I know you mentioned something about screenshots of of, what, of your searches and using certain databases. Are there any other tips you could offer? That's the main. That's the main one. Um, number two, make sure that you're not in your searches. You're not just limiting to a certain zip code. That's a no-no. Um, you know, you you can't make sure that when you're sourcing that you're sourcing for the actual basic qualifications and what you're searching for. And if people come up with those basic qualifications and you reach out to them and they can't get back to you, then they're considered a candidate. If you reach out, if you run a search string, for example, and it's a very, you know, you know, information assurance, cybersecurity, CISSP, needs a top secret, so on and so forth, 
and your search comes up with very little or nothing, then it's not a search you have to worry about. If your search comes up with 2,000 people in it, you may want to think about adding some more keywords like you teach, Jim, uh, to mm -hmm. bring it down to maybe 100 or maybe down to 50. Um, because you're going to be required to show, this is what my search basically showed, and you're supposed to, you're supposed to require, well, we're required now to hold it for three, three years. So if you're using a career builder uh, or a monster of these websites, some of them offer a way to save your search strings. However, I have not gotten a great answer yet from anybody in those groups saying that they're, if I'm not a customer of career builder for the next three years, where does my information go? Who's going to store it? How long are they going to store it for? How long do they store it for my account? Um, the other problem is, is the resumes that are going to be there won't be there three years from now, which I hope not. Um, you know, people are still, hopefully people have gotten a job by then. Uh, but, uh, you know, so I'm not going to come up with the exact same, I'm not going to come up with the same people in the same search string three years later. So you need to, if you're going to be doing a heavy searches, I mean, if you're doing heavy external search sourcing, you just really got to mind your P's and Q's. I like I think screenshots are probably the easiest because you do need to put it into the job folder. So when they come to audit you or they do a check a spot audit, everybody gets spot audited. By the way, uh, they're going to come in and look at your file, and if you did do sourcing, they're going to want to see what did you source and you know what were the screenshots, what kind of things did you get. Um, if you just did one source, then you have one screenshot. Um, my recommendation is if you are known for sourcing or it's a really tough position. Um, the, uh, and you find some people, what I recommend, and I've recommended this for a long time, is after you get through with your initial phone conversation with the individual, send them a link via email to your job and have them apply online. Sure. I know everybody sure. kind of goes, oh, you know, like that. I'm like, but it's going to, they have to fill out an application at some point. So if it's somebody you really want to move forward with and, and you're, now a can you're now a candidate, have them just apply. And explain to them why you're doing it, because pretty much everybody's going to have to be dealing this within the next six months to a year. And it will just become kind of one of those normal things. You want to get a job with a government contractor, this is what we got to do. Yeah, this reminds me of one of the conversations we were having there as well about the different tools that uh, sources use. And I remember um, eGrabber is account researcher, among other tools, mm -hmm. were, uh, were very popular there. And, and I, I especially like them now, <laughs> knowing all of this, yeah. because... I can do a search and it pulls all my information into a nice little spreadsheet, and that's—I imagine that would be great for Uncle Sam. So, yeah, there's uh, there's a couple of things out there. eGrabber is definitely one. There's another one by Platinum Recruiter called Talent Hook. If they're still around, yeah, I'm, I'm actually looking at probably maybe using them again because they do have a data dump site that'll dump all of the stuff into a uh, a spreadsheet for you as well. Uh, Perry Gorman's Archively, Archively is another interesting tool. That's a new. That's a new tool, right? Archively. Yeah, she's still. I think she might still be in beta right now, but you can you can add a request to to get on there. Uh, one of the recruiters yeah. here in the office has been using Archively, and she just loves it. I mean, he just it changed his whole way for him just to do his storage and stuff like that it was really really good for him. So we're looking at that as well. But I I tend to say try to stay away from stuff that's online because you don't know how long it's going to be online, or if you're going to have to pay for it. You know what I mean? It's better right. to, to have. It's, unfortunately, it's one of these things where it's better to actually have kind of a paper trail. Um, for all your listeners, if they want, um, I wrote up two OFCC, uh, OFCCP blogs on recruitingblogs.com. There's okay. part one and part two up there. So if they want to kind of follow up what we've been talking about, it's pretty much written out there, as well as um, cool. websites to go to and things like that. Yeah, great. Not, I will. <laughs> Cool, but not really cool, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, well, glad, cool in the sense that there's at least there's a resource that they can uh, take advantage of. Um, yeah, And exactly. that feels totally alone. Um, so cool in that response. Um, thank you, sir. Derek, thank you, sir. Derek Zeller, uh, heretofore known as Mr. Scary. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is going to stick, isn't it, Jim? <laughs> Thank you so much for your time and sharing your knowledge about OFCCT. Thanks, Jim. Take care.